to get together virtually to continue with our conservation education work. As your state affiliate of the National Wildlife Federation, uh, we are uh, working across this state to conserve and restore habitat for wildlife, everything from deer and turkeys to bears and alligators, songbirds and butterflies. Our wildlife face a number of threats though, including habitat loss from development, pollution and climate change. And about a year ago, STWF joined an effort, a nationwide effort to bring more awareness to climate change issues and potential solutions as it relates to impacts on wildlife in our state. So today's program is a part of that. We're also working to create online content um, to continue all of our education programs. And we invite you uh, to support us in this. Uh, we will be sharing a link if you are able uh, at this time to donate uh, to the Wildlife Federation after uh, today's event. Um, we sure would appreciate that so we can continue this work even in these crazy times. Um, but we're grateful today to have Dr. Dave Coyle here to share his research and offer solutions that we can implement at our own homes and our businesses. Uh, things like planting native plants to enhance habitat can make a big difference for wildlife right in our own backyards. Wildlife that is here in this area year round as well as our migratory species that pass through South Carolina. So we have lists of native plants that are good for wildlife on our website. And you can also have your yard certified through the National Wildlife Federation. And these certifications help to educate your neighbors and others in your community about the needs of wildlife and just amplify that positive impact. So you'll receive more information about those resources as well after today's webinar. So without further ado, I will introduce our presenter. Uh, we have Dr. David Coyle with us today from Clemson University, who specializes in forest health and invasive species. And he is a member of the Society of American Foresters and the Entomological Society of America. He serves on the board of directors for the North American Invasive Species Management Association and is co-director of Pro Forest. So uh, with that, David, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Sarah and Shannon. Thank you much. Alrighty, folks. Everyone should be seeing, seeing three little aliens, so we will get started here. Today we'll talk about uh, alien invasion is the title I've chosen, and this is pretty much talking about invasive species. We'll touch on climate change a little bit, but how are things now and how are they going to change it kind of how did we get here and then what can we do from that so without further ado i want to put out a disclaimer for all of this and i'm going to give you a lot of research-based information but i also have some opinions and you will get those in here uh, especially when it comes time to talk about things we should and should not plant in our yards so let's move on first thing we need to do is talk about some terms okay because there's a lot of terms that uh, get thrown around quite a bit here. Um, the first term is native. So a native thing, a native species means it is from here. Now what people say is what does here mean? Most often I look at here as a continental thing, right? So if you have something in the United States, maybe a country because we have a large country, but if you get to Europe where the countries are some of the size of some of our states, because things move from country to country, it doesn't really make a big biological deal. Um, if something moves from Mexico to South Texas, it's probably not moving that far, but technically it's a new, technically it's a new country. If something comes from Europe and gets into this country, that's a bigger deal. So for me, native is at a continent scale. And we've got three terms that all mean it is not from here, not from this country, not from this continent. Non-native, exotic, and alien. They all mean it's just something that is not normally from here. Now the difference is invasive. So invasive species are not from here, okay? All invasive species are not from here. Invasives have three main characteristics. One, they're not from here. Two, they cause a lot of damage, whether that's economic damage or environmental damage. And three, they can displace or, or push out native species. All invasives are not from here. 
all exotics are not necessarily invasive. We have a lot of, of pests in this country that are not from here, but they don't really do anything. We don't really hear about them. And beetles, bark beetles is a great example. Ambrosia beetles. We've got so many different non-native ambrosia beetles here that you have probably never heard of because they're not that big a deal ecologically and economically. Some are, not all of them are. So then the question, are all non-native species bad? I would argue no, not all of them are bad. And here's three non-native species that a lot of us eat very regularly, right? Peas, oranges, and potatoes are not from North America. Not, you know, potatoes from South America, um, you know, peas, and citrus, these are not from here. So they are not necessarily bad. If you leave a potato in the ground, it's not going to take over the whole, the whole ditch outside your house, right? If you leave a pea plant, it's not going to take over uh, the woods next to your place. <clears throat> a lot of native, non-native species don't explode in their populations and displace, the invas and displace the native species. So it's a big, big difference there. So not all non-natives are bad, but then there's the question, are all invasive species bad? Hopefully you remember what we just talked about and you know that yes, yes, all invasive species are bad because one of the things they do is cause harm, cause damage, and displace native species. And uh, most of you probably weren't expecting to see a shirtless Jack Black today, but now you've got it, so your day is complete. So the invasion curve, this is something that we use all the time when we talk about managing invasive species. So on the left side of this graph, it says area infested. So as you go up on the graph, you have more area infested. As you go across the bottom from left to right, it's time. So at the very, very bottom left corner, there's a little arrow that points to a point that says introduction. That is when the first thing got here, whatever invasive uh, or non-native thing you're talking about, the first one got here. Now, if it's invasive, those populations are going to start to grow. And that's where you see the dark green. It's getting a little bigger there. As you go uh, to the right with more time, you have more area infested. At some point, excuse me, we detect that thing, fungus, vertebrate, insect, whatever. At some point, we find it, okay? At that point, and even just a little beyond that, we can still eradicate it because it's probably in a pretty small area. Uh, we can put enough resources there to just wipe that thing out. The problem is sometimes these things are really hard to find. A teeny tiny beetle, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, and, and public awareness especially doesn't usually begin until much later, until much more area gets affected. That's when landowners start losing trees or crops or you start seeing you know, impacts on a lake because there's all these invasive mussels. That's when your public awareness typically starts. That's when politicians start getting pressure about, hey, are you going to do something about this thing? But unfortunately, by that point, the populations are usually big enough to where you can't eradicate them anymore. And from then on, that curve sort of flattens out. And all you can do is manage it at a local level, in your yard, in your field, in your county, in your state. That's really all we're left to do. So with that said, I feel like we need to address the invasive species elephant in the room, which is obviously the murder hornet, or uh, this is a horrible name, by the way, so it, do not call it the murder hornet. It is an Asian giant hornet. Uh, you need to call it something. There's actually a Japanese giant hornet that's already in this, uh, in this country. Call it a sparrow hawk or a sparrow hornet or something like that. So these have been all over the news in the last week. It started from a New York Times article, I believe, just yeah, six days ago. Um, contrary to what you may have heard, these are not coming to murder you or your mom or your children or anything like that. These things get their name because they are known to their predators. So they will feed, they will predate on honeybees and beehives, and they murder bees. This is true, right? This is one of the things they do. Uh, it's a fascinating um, thing. Normally these things will nest, well, they always nest in the ground. So what they'll do is go forage and search for food. They will, um, if they come into a hive, they might kill a bee, maybe two. And then they sort of take what they've killed and they, they get rid of the head, the abdomen, the legs, and they keep the thorax, the middle part of that body, because that's where a lot of the, the good stuff is, the meat, the nutrients. And so they take this meatball, and they fly it back to their young and they feed them. Uh, they have this really interesting behavior where if there's more than one of these hornets, they go into basically a feeding frenzy 
and then they just start killing honeybees left and right. And so this is how they get that name. If you get a bunch of these by a hive, they're not just killing one and taking it back to their nest. They're just killing, 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 killing. Them. And they'll actually go home for the night, come back the next morning and keep killing and keep killing. That's how they get the name. So a hive was found in um, near Vancouver, British Columbia last year. It was successfully eradicated. They found uh, one specimen, I think, this year, I think it might even have been dead, way up in Washington State. So, quick question for everybody. Have you seen an Asian giant hornet in South Carolina or in the eastern U.S.? Um, everybody think about this answer really carefully, um, and I'll give drop, you a clue. Drop your answer to this question in the comments. Yes, yes. There are multiple correct answers in this one, by the way, folks. So, we've got a no. We've got four. All of the above. <laughs> good, good. Someone good. said maybe a cicada killer. Yeah, so so this is good. So this is not meant to be a hard quiz. We do not Someone have Someone said these. five. <laughs> <laughs> if that's, yeah, well, we don't have these here. And I know um, a lot of people think they have seen one. I can I can pretty much guarantee that you have not. And how, some, some have asked me, how do you know what I've seen? Um, you know, if we had these here, we would have had honey beekeepers and beekeepers reporting mortality. It's simply not happened. We, we don't have these here. The only place this particular thing is known from is way up in the pack Northwest. So we do not have this thing here. It is extremely isolated. The term murder hornet is unfortunate. It's very overblown. It's not like they go murder people. This is just, it's a bad common name is what it is. So what I want to do, though, is get back to this invasion curve. Remember, we talked about when it first starts and first detected, you can still eradicate it. And this is where we are with this Asian giant hornet. We are still at the detection phase, maybe even in front of that, because now we can't find the thing again. Right? There was a hive. It was killed. Now we cannot find it again. So there's all sorts of monitoring efforts out there. They're really trying to just completely wipe this thing out and eliminate it. And it doesn't seem to be that... Uh, invasive. I mean, it, the populations haven't spread like they, they typically would for something like an emerald ash borer. So we're optimistic. The, the moral of the story, though, is especially in this part of the world, we do have lots of big and stripy things, right? I don't doubt that you have seen something big uh, with black and yellow stripes that can sting you. Uh, in this picture on the left, you've got your standard cicada killer. Uh, these I, don't, I can't think of anyone ever being stung. They, they hunt cicadas, and that's kind of their thing. Yellow jackets are the next one from the left. Those will sting. Those are kind of, those are not the most pleasant creature out there. You've got one of the Japanese giant hornets there, and then you've got a, a bumblebee next to that. So they're out there, but the Asian giant hornet, we do not have that here in South Carolina, North Carolina, the Eastern U.S. at all. So here's some good resources. I asked uh, Shannon, she's going to push those out through the chat box. Here's resources you should use. Okay, go to your local extension whatever state you're in, go to the extension, go to the state. Uh, highly recommend you don't go to something like Jack and Jill's garden blog, right? Go to a professional for this type of thing. I'm sure Jack and Jill are great, but go to a professional for this. And here's three really good, uh, really good um, references. Um, and finally, one last point. Yes, the murder hornet is distantly related to the killer bee. It's my dad joke for the day. Okay, so there's that. Anyway, so let's pivot a little bit. We talked about invasives. Let's talk about temperature because we're going through some temperature things in our world. It does affect everything, right? It affects your mood. It affects how things grow. And it particularly affects insects because they're ectotherms. So how, what they feel outside affects how they grow. So this graph, you can see the outside temperature on the bottom. And I've got body temperature of the insect on the left. As the outside temperature goes up, the insect's body temperature goes up. Okay, so what does that mean? A warmer body temperature for an insect means it's going to grow bigger, it's going to grow faster. And so I'll demonstrate this. You can probably tell I have little kids because this is the second kid movie reference I've had in here. So we've got very hungry caterpillars starting at the bottom left in each of these graphs. Each of these caterpillars were fed the exact same thing. The only difference is they were at a different temperature regime, right? So, so in the top, you've got 66 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, 61 at night, in the middle, 72 and 66. 
at the bottom, 77 and 72. One of the diets had high nitrogen, one of the diets had low nitrogen. It's, it's very well known that the more nitrogen an insect eats, the bigger it's gonna grow also. So that's why those lines are a little different. But the thing to really look at is how long it took, because at the bottom, from left to right, it's how many days it took the insect to reach pupation in this case, right? How many days did it take that caterpillar to grow up? Here's what happens when you have the lower temperatures, right? You get a caterpillar that eventually matures. It takes a, you know, takes a little bit longer, gets fairly big. As you increase that size though, you're gonna get that same mature caterpillar faster and it's gonna be bigger. And then as you still increase that size, it's going to be even bigger and even faster. So if you look from the top to the bottom, you get caterpillars that are about, you know, not quite twice the size, they're a little bit bigger, but also it, it took about half the time to get from larva, from an egg hatching, all the way to a pupating larva. That's a very big difference as far as in terms of how long it takes that insect to complete a life cycle. Now fungi operate in kind of the same way. So with a fungus, if it's too cold, too cold it's not gonna grow. If it's too hot, it's gonna die. So there's a happy, happy medium somewhere, right? And so this, uh, all these graphs behind you are from this older publication where they looked at all these different fungi at different temperatures. And here's your general pattern. Again, if it's too cold, like on the very far uh, left, nothing grows. And as you increase temperature, it grows faster and faster and faster. But there's always a point at which point it is too hot for that fungus and it dies and crashes. So fungus, the more you, you know, and, and this too hot to crash point, we're probably not going to see that. That's like uh, something you can probably only get in the lab. And so let's talk about plant biology 101, right? The, Plants are also affected by temperature. Everything outside is affected by temperature. The faster something grows is often related to temperature and what it eats. Plants, same way. Um, plants are also unique in that they cannot move, they can't respond to differences in temperature by migrating. Right? If that's in the ground, that's just where it's going to stay. But as the temperature grows up, those plants, that plant biology also increases in its, its rate. Now let's talk about weather versus climate. These are questions we get quite a bit of time and for that I've employed Luna, uh, our faithful dog. She's happy to help out. She just likes to be a part of the family here. So let's look at it this. This is Luna on a walk and I want you to imagine that this um, sidewalk is your climate and then Luna is the weather. Okay, sometimes the climate and the weather line up perfectly. Okay, they're, they're right in line with what you would predict. Sometimes the weather you get is a little bit off what you would expect for that particular climate, right? That happens. Sometimes it is way off what you'd expect for that climate, that happens too. But eventually it's all gonna come back and line up again. So one quote I heard from um, Dr. Marshall Shepard at UGA, he's a really well-known uh, climatologist. If you don't like the weather, put on a coat. If you don't like the climate, you gotta move. Okay, climate is just very, very long-term trends in weather. That's all that is, right? So, so we don't have climate today. We have weather today. Uh, that's another way to think about it. So we've talked about invasive species. We've talked about climate change. Um, now we're going to talk about global trade. And you, some may think this is kind of a funny thing to shoehorn in here, but it actually makes quite a bit of sense. So we'll start by saying the U.S. imported over $3 trillion of goods in 2019. Okay, this Surprise. A lot of stuff comes into this country on this, what I think is a really cool map. It shows the U.S. and it shows all these arrows to different countries. If the arrow is pointing towards the U.S., it means stuff came in. Uh, and, and also if it's, if it's red. If it's green, it shows how much stuff goes out. So you can see there's two big green arrows, one going to Mexico, one going to Canada. We send a lot of stuff to Canada and Mexico. There's one great big red arrow would people like to take a guess where that is coming from in the chat box? Hopefully this is not too difficult. It is from China, right? We have a lot of stuff from China in this country. It's, you know, there's that little gold sticker you tend to see all the time. So China's a main partner. Even when you look at each individual state, this is from 2016. Now, I, you know, most of the, the states, China's in that pink, especially in the southeastern U.S., I don't want any of uh, our fellow South Carolinians to get cocky. I know this says Germany, but that's also changed. 
China is our number one trade partner now as well. So, and there's a lot of ports in the Southeast, right? So you've got a lot of stuff coming from China over to here. Now, why does that matter? I'm gonna now switch over to world forest vegetation zones. Just, just looks at across the whole world, what kind of forest is there? Is it a pine forest? Is it like an oak beech forest? Is it a, 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 a you know, tundra type thing? If we look at where we are in the southeastern U.S., it's bright yellow. And if you look over here to China, same type of forest. So they might not have longleaf pine and loud lolly pine and water oak growing there. But they've got other pines. They've got other oaks. They've got a, a, a different type of sweet gum, a different type of liquid ambar growing over there. Very similar composition. As you move up the coast in the east, same scenario, right? We've got this uh, temperate mixed forest as you get a little farther north here, same thing in China. Same thing if you did get even farther north where you know, you're Scandinavian countries over to the northeastern Canada, you've got the same type of climate. And even looking at California and the Mediterranean, that's why all this dry stuff tends to get, uh, become pestiferous in California because it's got that same climate as the Mediterranean. So you've got very similar areas. If something gets on a shipment in China and makes it all the way to the East Coast and is still alive and gets out, the odds are that it's going to emerge from whatever it's in. A lot of times it could be uh, wood packing material. It could be the stuff that they're shipping you know, itself. It could be just hitchhiking on that, that big container ship. It's going to get out. It's going to feel a very sim similar weather. It's going to find very similar uh, environment, host trees in a lot of the wood woodpacking things, and there's going to be no natural enemies. So it kind of sets it on this course where it can just really explode. So this all makes sense in theory, but is it actually happening? So let's go ahead and do some examples. I want to do just a couple here. So we'll start with Laurel Wilt and the Red Band Brogia Beetle. This is um, Raphaella Lauricula and Xyloborus Calabritus. These are both native to Asia. It is a very standard ambrosia beetle as far as ambrosia beetles go. Very small uh, insect. It bores into the tree and it makes these tunnels. Uh, the larvae actually feed on fungus that grows inside the tunnels. Um, if you see right in the center there, those, those frass tubes, we call them frass tubes. That's a combination of sawdust and some fungal mycelia and also bug poop. So there, as a female is chewing her way in there, she just sort of pushes that stuff out behind her. Um, Again, they have pockets on their, on their bodies right about here, and then fungal spores get out. And then you can see in that upper right corner, uh, there's black on the inside of those tunnels. That's because that's fungus growing there, and the larvae feed on the fungus. Below that fungal staining, the fungus then clogs the conductive tissues of the tree, and that's what ends up killing the tree. Okay. Um, Laurel will, the host for this beetle is anything in the family of Lauraceae. Okay, so this is your red bays, your swamp bays, your silk bay camphor tree, sassafras, avocados in this, uh, in this family as well. Any tree in this family is susceptible to laurel wilt. And what it looks like, it, you know, these beetles, it's one of the few ambrosia beetles that will attack a healthy tree. Most ambrosia beetles just hit trees that are already weak or dying of something. This one attacks healthy ones. Red bays are especially easy to see because as you can see in this a year or more. So we have estimated that laurel wilt has killed between 300 and 500 million trees in the southeastern U.S. And this is just sort of a heat map showing where most of that damage is. It is bright red in the coast of uh, Georgia and South Carolina, which makes sense because we found this thing first back in 02, uh, right around Savannah, Georgia, almost by the, where South Carolina meets us here. So this gets back to the whole difficulty of first detecting something have because you have a beetle here okay you've got this beetle and this beetle is not large it is about the size of a sprinkle on a donut okay so you're looking for a sprinkle on a donut somewhere in the forest in the shipping material in whatever it's very very hard to find um, it's decimated the florida avocado industry there's fear that it will get from texas down to mexico because if we're if we're being honest here that's where a lot of the commercial avocado production happens it's in central mexico uh, there's Lauraceae hosts that kind of take it all the way down there. So that is a definite fear. There's also a big fear about the sassafras because a lot of the central hardwoods region of the U.S., Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, even southern Illinois, 
Sassafras is a big component of the forest there. I know down here it's kind of, you find one here and there, it doesn't get that big. Up there it gets a lot, lot lower. So then the question, how did Laurel Wilk get started? So that was a good question. We've got some really smart people out there. So they collected these beetles. They collected red bay beetles from all across, uh, you know, the southeastern U.S. They did some fancy science. They did some genetic stuff, and they looked for cytochrome oxidase 1. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not a geneticist. So when I hear my colleagues talk about stuff like this, it just sounds like some magic lab stuff. They looked at all this, this genetic stuff, and what they ended up finding was all of the red bay ambrosia beetles likely came from a single introduction. That might have been a single handful of beetles. It might have been a single individual beetle, and that can happen because ambrosia beetles can uh, reproduce without mating. They don't need to have a male to mate. A female can just go and lay by. So it's difficult when you think about how can we find one little teeny tiny beetle the size of a sprinkle anywhere, right? It's an extremely difficult task. And so it's got big implications. So back in 2008, uh, some scientists created, um, the good colleagues created a map of the spread of laurel wilt if nothing was done. Right? So this is what it looked like. Uh, take note particularly of this chunk I have circled because that's, what shouldn't be infested today, right? It's only 2020, so that's where that red line is. And now I want to show you the current map, the current infestation map for laurel wilt. Uh, you can see it, it got, we first found it in 2002, right there in Portland, North Georgia. But there is that area that, according to the prediction map, has not, shouldn't have been impacted yet. There's also this area up here. I mean, this is up here in Kentucky. This is very recent. What this is telling us is that humans are moving this beetle around and whether it's in firewood or um, you know, just accidentally, this is what moves stuff around and this is what we've got to get people to stop doing. And I know it's very, um, it's a, there's a, some allure there to, hey, look at all the free firewood I can take to deer camp or look at all the free firewood I can take to grandma's place for Thanksgiving, but we can't be moving stuff around because this is exactly what happens. And if we get back to this invasion curve, if you remember, the Asian giant hornet was down there by detection, but Laurel Wilt and Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle, that's way up here um, where there's local management and control only, and that's even very difficult. I know we've got some folks from Kentucky, from uh, North Carolina, from other places. I'm not talking about the Emerald, I'm not going to talk about the Emerald Ash Borer, but if we did, that would be right up here by the, by the Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle. That thing is here to stay. Uh, all we can do is manage on a local level. You can keep trees in your yard alive easy enough uh, with chemicals, but we'll never be rid of either of these two pests on the landscape. So how does this relate to the whole climate change thing? Because it really does. So, so they looked at the temperature tolerance of this beetle. What can this beetle handle from a temperature perspective? What they found was um, they were able to sort of divide the country into three types of areas. So first, there's this area here uh, below the blue line, pretty much all the beetles are going to survive, right? The weather, the climate is good enough, so all these beetles will be just fine. Then there's <clears throat> this red line up here that's above the red line, it's too cold. So all the beetles that get up there are going to die. Okay? And then you've got this middle swath, right? That's basically Missouri, most of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, et cetera. That's where you're going to get some mortality, uh, some will die, some will live, kind of a half and half scenario. This is, this is right now, okay, this is under our current climate scenario. As the climate warms, right, if you look at the predictions of how the climate is going to change in the coming years, all of that stuff shifts north. So you see that blue line has shifted north. So now you've got beetles living, all the beetles living all the way up into lower Michigan, okay? The only place you have beetles dying is places like Minnesota, Northern Iowa, and some of Wisconsin. And that area where beetles can live and die has also shifted up. So you've got kind of the whole Great Lakes region now. And remember, they have lots of sassafras up there, and that's the primary thing that would be impacted by this beetle. So we'll do another quiz now. What Laurel wilt can affect what kind of trees? Put your answer in the chat box. We got some threes. 
Red Bay, everybody seems pretty pretty solid on the Red Bay. All right, everybody gets a gold star because Red Bay is the correct answer. So good job, folks, good job. So that's, you know, a little bit about how changing temperatures can affect, can affect invasive insects we already have here. So what about invasive plants? That's kind of the next thing. So a little background on invasive plants. Why did they get here? There's really two main reasons when we get invasive plants here. It's a reminder of home. I put cookies here because when I was in college, my mom would make me chocolate chip cookies anytime I went home. So that was like my reminder of home. Uh, here. But also they come in here because they're a business opportunity. People see an opportunity there with something new. Um, you know, a lot of times it's a get rich quick thing and most often it does not work. We'll touch back on that later. But they also, they can often be introduced as ornamentals of forages, you know, something for cattle to eat. Um, if you actually look at the ideal forage plant, this column on the left versus the common invasive plant, many of these traits are the same. Like the ideal forage plant, you want something that's easy to establish. That is something a common invasive plant can also do. It can grow and establish kind of anywhere. Uh, rapid growth rate and high yield, same thing with invasive plants. It's got a lot of the same um, characteristics, which is unfortunate because if it's brought over here, as a forage and then sort of abandon, it's probably going to get out and quickly become invasive. Very few things eat invasive plants, right? If it's not from here, then the herbivores we have here have not co-evolved with it. They're not used to it. They don't eat it. And this just shows that the, the higher you get on this little chart, the more stuff that, uh, that eats it. And if you look at invasive things on the left, barely anything touches it. Right, versus non-invasive stuff, native things we have there, that's uh, you know, a lot more is gonna eat that stuff. They have rapid early growth and can adapt to new environments. Now this data is really interesting. This is actually Loblolly pine data, but it is in South America where it is not native, right? Pines are not native in South America. Um, this just shows you that as you have a more invasive population, as you go up on that chart, the trees in those more invasive populations have more leaf area. They also grow faster. So we actually see, even within a country, um, populations that are at the advancing edge of, a, of an infestation have different growth characteristics. So they've got some plasticity there. These invasive plants can make a lot of seeds. And this is a really cool paper that came out a couple, well, three years ago now about Elanthus altissima, the tree of heaven. What they found that was in a 40 year lifetime, they could produce on average 10 million seeds. And of those 10 million seeds, 65% of them were viable. Okay, so that is a whole bunch of potential new seedlings coming up from, that's from a single tree. That's from one single tree, mind you. Um, bringing it closer to home, and this is the calorie pear tree I visited last week. I had to get out of the house, so I went and did I circled the branch down there. I actually collected that one branch off this probably 30 foot tree. And this is what it looked like when I put it, you know, I picked all the leaves off that branch. So this is all the seeds you're seeing on there. And what I found was all of these were the live seeds. It was a 42 inch branch and there were 200 live seeds on it. And again, this is just one branch on this big 30 foot tall mature calorie pear tree. So it's, it's, I mean, it's almost tough to fathom how many seeds are on that thing entirely. It's a lot of seeds, okay? Plants will uh, establish in disturbed areas, especially invasive ones. This is Juncus down there in Australia, and I picked this picture because it's this disturbed, washed out waterway, and the Juncus is this red, uh, red grassy type thing that's just completely taken over, right? So water washed everything away, and boom, this stuff just grows up. The plants have very hardy roots or rhizomes. This is what's shown here. This is really important because um, a lot of times those roots and rhizomes can stand really harsh conditions for a while where that plant kind of waits to get reestablished. It can be traveled, it can be pulled out of the ground and sit above ground for a while. It can be transported on a piece of equipment. Um, those hardy roots and rhizomes serve as sort of a, a long-term feeding thing. It just keeps that plant kicking barely alive. And then you also get these invasive, uh, invasive plants will form these extensive dense infestations. This is Kogon grass down in Florida. Every bit of that bright green stuff you see is Kogon grass, right? It doesn't leave any room for anything else to grow up in there. As you know, in addition to this, 
they can grow practically anywhere. And here you see Phragmites, which is a really invasive uh, grass, practically growing into the road up in uh, New York, right? So this is not an environment that a lot of things can grow in, but a lot of invasive plants can not only tolerate that, but they can thrive in this type of environment. You know, one other thing they can do is they have what we call allelopathic chemicals. These are chemicals that stunt the growth of other plants. They're sometimes prevented altogether. In this uh, example, we look at lettuce seedling. And why do we look at lettuce? We have two things, uh, white snake root, which is native, and Japanese silk grass, which is not native. So we know that white snake root gives off allelopathic chemicals that suppress lettuce growth. What we also found from this is that Japanese silk grass does the same thing. It gives off allelopathic chemicals. And that is partially why when you come into a stand of Japanese silk grass in a, in a bottomland somewhere, there's nothing else growing in there grows so dense it crowds it out and anything that tries to start growing in there there's these allelopathic chemicals it's, it's got to contend with and that gives you these these monocultures of Japanese silk grass. And then there's a sit and wait strategy that many uh, many employ. This is oriental bittersweet. In this case the seedlings will establish in the forest and just waits for a canopy gap. When a tree falls or, or is blown over it aggressively grows up and overtakes these trees. This is sort of your invasive plant book for this part of the world. Uh, they don't print them anymore to my knowledge, but you can get them online. Um, if you wanna request that book, you really just need to Google invasive plants, Southeastern US, and everything should pop up. There's apps out there that can help you identify stuff as well. So there's a lot of online resources for these types of things. So invasive plants, when did they get here? We know when almost all the invasive plants that we deal with, we know when they got here because they were brought here on purpose. You know, starting from the late, mid, late 1700s all the way up into the early 1900s, we've got records of when stuff came here. One thing we know as well, so we know when stuff got here, we also know that our climate is changing and it is getting warmer, okay? And this is a nonpartisan thing. This is what a thermometer tells us. It is getting warmer as you, you come up in the last few years. This was a study and a, a figure that really, I think, illustrates it well. They sort of looked at where do humans live in the world? And they're sort of the sweet spot of temperature where the most people live, obviously, right? Not a lot of people live in the Yukon. A lot of people live in, you know, kind of middle, you know, the middle of America. So that top figure in A, it shows what, you know, where, what are the temperatures where most of the people live, okay? Figure B shows what it's predicted to be like in 2070 and figure C shows you the change. And what I want you to look at is all the red and orange in figure C. That is all the places where stuff is gonna get a lot warmer than it is now, okay? Everything is gonna change. Um, there's a few places that might not change as much, but everything is gonna do some sort of change. So what does this mean for plants, right? Well, it means the plant hardiness zones are going to shift. So they've looked at those plant hardiness zones. And if you remember, this is, you know, anyone that plants something, it says good for zones, you know, seven through 10 or, or two through six. It's basically a temperature range where a plant can survive, right? It takes into account summer temperatures, winter temperatures, all of them. So in the past 10 years, you can already see that these zones have shifted up. They've shifted north. Um, you know, th things that you know, normally would only grow in, in parts of the upstate. Now you can plant them all the way to the Tennessee border in some cases. This doesn't look too drastic, but if you go ahead and look for the next 30 years, there are major shifts, you know, in the next 30 years, stuff that only grows in the panhandle of Florida can probably be grown in Charleston, okay? Stuff that only grows in, you know, south of Georgia will be able to be grown in, in northern, northern South Carolina. So, you're seeing this big shift where, where it's getting warmer and that's changing plant hardiness zones. And that is gonna allow plants to also move with that. So let's talk about cal repair for a minute. This is something I've worked a lot on. I've, I've, some of you may have heard me speak on this before. It's my nemesis of sorts, but it's also the Bradford pear, the species is pyrus calorie. So I will never argue with people that it is a pretty tree. Okay, I'm willing to concede that fully. Bradford pear is pretty when it's blooming. Unfortunately, it also has quite a pungent odor. 
Uh, there's many descriptors out there. My, my favorite is smells like rotting fish and semen from Business Insider in 2013. So it's got quite an odor and um, I, I firmly believe that. So you can't, you can't tell me different. Some people say they can't smell it and good for you, that's awesome. But for those of us that can smell it, it stinks. One thing we need to know about Bradford pear, it's a grafted cultivar. So that means they've got sort of two different things on that particular tree. You've got scions from a Bradford. So all the Bradfords came from one tree back in the 1950s. Um, and then they take that, that woody part of the stem branch and they put it onto a rootstock that's the same species as Pyrus calariana, but it's not any particular thing. It's just a, a rootstock they've got growing on. So what that means is, you end up having this tree that is from the top up. It is pure Bradford pear, one type of genetics, but the bottom is just a rootstock of whatever that particular one is for that species. Like, like you and I are all different. All those rootstocks are different in some of the genetic ways. So Bradford itself was commercially released in 1961. It was first actually noticed that it would escape cultivation in Arkansas in 64, 65 in Maryland. Um, they knew it had structural problems back in the 80s, but it was planted all over the place. Even back in 2009, they recorded, you know, 23 plus million in sales. New cultivars have been created, but these are all still Pyrus caloriana. Um, so then the question, why is Bradford growing in the ditch or the woods or my fence line? One of the things that this was, this tree was marketed as being sterile. So it's self-incompatible. So that's totally true. Meaning if you have only Bradford pear, then they can't make seeds because you can't take pollen from a Bradford pear and pollinate another one successfully. Um, but if you have any other pyrus, either pyrus communist, which is kind of a European pear, which we get fruit from, or a different cultivar of Bradford pear, like different genetics of some way, you can get seeds. And so here's how that is described. If you've got three streets, and nothing on there, it's, it's everything on there is simply a Bradford pear. You will not get a viable seed if that's the only pollen. It's usually pollinated by insects. All it takes is for one of those to be something else, a Chanticleer cultivar, for instance. Um, and then that pollen from that one can pollinate all the other ones, all the other Bradfords in there, and all of a sudden you've got Birds eat these seeds, um, starlings, uh, blue jays, the bigger type of birds, they eat them. Birds do what birds do. They eat stuff, they fly, so they fly somewhere and they poop. And that's how we get new infestations. That's why it's growing along your fence line. That's why it's growing in the woods. That's why it's growing everywhere is because birds have pooped it out and there you go. Um, in some cases, it's really easy to see that this is what happened. And this is uh, kind of right by where I live, just a few miles away. Uh, right here are a row of, I think there's five, there used to be six, there's five Bradford pear trees, okay? Across the road is a field of calorie pear, okay? And these most likely came from those Bradford pears right there in a pretty little row. And if you look even closer, you can see the Bradford, the calorie pears closest to the road dense and they're larger. And so as you go farther away from the Bradford, you've got fewer of them and they're smaller. That's because the birds, the first thing they do is they poop, they poop. And then they will sit there and then, and, you know, so slowly goes that way. So they are very invasive. I mean, there's pictures all over. This spring was great. A lot of people um, capture drone footage. This is a whole bunch of calorie pears in a woodland in Indiana, right? This is the middle of the woods, right? Just this Brown area is all trees. It's oak and pecan and some other things that just haven't leafed out yet. But you're seeing all those white calorie pear flowers because they're now throughout the woods. Uh, it was, it's a common misconception that calorie pear only grows on fence lines and roadsides and old fields. That is completely not the case. This thing will grow absolutely anywhere. It will grow in old fields, of course, right? It grows along the roadsides, of course. Um, so lots are extremely common to have calorie pear in there. And like you saw, a couple of pictures ago, we see it in forests quite a bit, right? Um, and so there's there's some maps out there. EdMaps is a great tool for folks that want to um, track where some of these things are. This is where it's been recorded. This is very incomplete, right? I think the more complete map is going to be looking at the future range, okay? And I think this is one of those cases where we're probably already seeing the future range is probably now as far as where this thing is. But as we go forward, as 
the climate warms, as we have these changes, you're going to see that that edge, especially going west and north, it's going to keep creeping out. Um, I have had some that say, who cares, really, because it's such a pretty tree, right? You've got these flowers everywhere. It's great. Man, I contend this tree is absolutely horrible. The thorns are one thing. Okay, they will completely stick you. They will draw blood. They will pop tires and cost managers a lot of money. These things are very, very invasive. We've got a student at Tennessee who's working on the genetics of cattle repair, and, and she has found, again, I'm not a geneticist, so this is what it means. It's got every characteristic you look for in an invasive population, high gene flow, high number of alleles, number of private alleles. All these are very characteristic of extremely invasive plants. And this should be obvious. I, I hope it's obvious to most of you out there because you can see these things all over the place in the spring. Like they're one of the first things to whiten up. Um, it's, it's a really interesting thing because by the time it gets into the wild, it's got this variable genetics, right? Because the parents are some parents are Bradford, some are wild calorie pair, and in some cases you get two calorie pairs breeding together. But you have all this variable phenology. This is one shot uh, close to where I lived where at one time you can see a uh, calorie pair fully, almost fully leafed out. You can see some that are sort of in that half flower, half leaf stage. You can see some that are fully flowered. And you can see some that are just starting to break bud all at the same time. So highly variable, and what that variability does is just give it an advantage to try to take over site. It sort of hedges its bets by putting a little bit in each, a little money in each compartment, so to speak. They grow very thick together. This is a, sh a shot from inside a pretty dense stand uh, next to Columbia, South Carolina. Very little sunlight coming in, and even when you look, you know, this is looking at a calorie pair patch on the right, and on the left is an old field, and there's a very distinct line starts and stops. Nothing is growing in there because it just shades out all the light and it's just so competitive it doesn't allow anything else. And even beyond that, you know, we met with a, a, a horse farmer earlier this year. I forget this pony's name, but at one point it had scratches all over its face because it was running in this field. It ran into these calorie pears, which are these little bushes you see in the pasture, and just completely scraped its face up. Uh, one of its mother actually stepped on the thorn and got some nasty foot infection and so we went out there and they had been just cutting them off and cutting them off and of course they grow up bunchier and thornier what she didn't realize uh, was that they had two great big calorie pear trees right on the edge of the pasture that were just these big seed tips um, so our next quiz question should you plant a Bradford pear tree okay so here's four answers yes no Absolutely not, and please don't choose number one. Those are your options. So put that in the chat window, and I hope everyone does well. We've got a lot of threes and fours, some absolutely nots, but mostly threes good. and fours. Good, good. Everyone's paying attention. That's what I like to hear. This is great. Um, these are softball questions too, right? Because I spend all my teaching time with our children, and I just don't have it in me to make a hard question anymore. So uh, moving on. What can we do at this point in time? It's, and I, sometimes I feel like all I ever talk about is doom and gloom and all hope is lost and here comes the invasives and we're completely, you know, SOL. It's not, not the case, not the case. There are things we can do. First of all is, is just make sure our behaviors are in line with what is right from a, from a natural invasive species perspective. Don't move stuff around, okay? That's not my chart for the record. Don't move firewood around because things can live in there, right? There's been research that shows that insects can live in pieces of firewood up to three years, okay? So just because it maybe fell down in your yard, it's been a year, then you might take it somewhere. Stuff can still come out of there and get established somewhere else. The next thing is plant native species, right? This is some Bradford pears in downtown Charleston, and Charleston's a beautiful city, and they can do so much better than having these Bradford pears. And one thing that um, you know, we've, we had a Bradford pear bounty program this year where we gave away native trees to people if they would cut down their Bradford pear, right? So there's all these great native tree options that you can put in your yard, in, your, in the farm, wherever. If you're looking for spring flowers, there's great native options. If you're looking for fall color, there are great native options. It's just that they're not common in the landscape. And, um, you know, a lot of people tend to just buy kind of what's at the box store, 
they don't always ask for some of their options. So ask around, there's great stuff to put in. What else can you do? You can speak from your wallet, right? And I think of this as a whole, if you build it, they will come thing. If people stop buying things like brand shares, they will stop producing them, right? If people stop buying Privet as a hedge, they will stop producing it. Um, so, so part of this just gets down to what can we do at the local level? That's control kind of what we buy and where we put our, uh, our financial support. And speaking of support, speak with your voice, right? I'm not saying everyone needs to go run for office, but one thing we do know is that invasive species is bipartisan. So I've met with this, this lady as you know, in my role at the North American Invasive Species Management Association. She, she knows this is a bipartisan thing and invasive species bills are not hard to get through. Uh, they just you know, need someone to champion them. One thing we do know though is climate change is incredibly partisan and that's where it gets a little trickier in that um, you know, it, it's a very hot button issue I will not say controversial because science does not say that it's controversial. It is not controversial. It's happening. Uh, the implications of it are controversial. That's the only thing. But, but, but speak with your voice, right? If you're a representative, your senator at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, tell them what you think and you can help make a difference because they, if they don't hear from people, they're not going to think it's important. It's, it's one of those volume matters. So if they get calls about something, that's what they determine gets important. So that is something you can do. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dave. We really appreciate sure. it. Um, all right, if anyone's got any questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat box. We will do our best to get all of them answered. And for those of you who missed um, screen, the South Carolina Wildlife Federation Executive Director's little spiel at the beginning, um, if you're new to the Wildlife Federation, we um, conserve and restore South Carolina's wildlife through education and advocacy. So uh, please check out our website if you want to make a donation that will help us as we continue to host these free webinars and free classes. When we're not dealing with coronavirus, we are often hosting classes on bird watching and dragonflies and kayaking and archery. So we've got a lot of different programs that we do in addition to our advocacy work and lobbying on behalf of wildlife habitat here in our state. Let's see, here's a question. I think you had a photo of a calorie pear in a pine stand. Will prescribed burning kill those off or are they resistant? Or are they resistant and resilient to fire? Good question. Yeah, so so fire will top kill them, but they will come right back. There's only been one um, good comprehensive study of that. I was done in Indiana in an old field, um, and they found that for every stem that was top killed by fire, four stems came back. So think of it as just a form of mowing is all that fire is going to do to it. Um, I tell you what we don't know is how it would uh, work in a forest because in an old, file, old field there's all sorts of sunlight getting down there in a forest they're probably probably a little more stressed because they're fighting for sunlight. Um, we don't know if it would kill any of the seedlings so there's a, those are actually some studies we're trying to get established. We'd hope to do this year but of course everything was kind of railroaded by, by COVID but there's a lot of questions. I don't think there's any any uh, indication that fire is the only thing that can be used, but I think fire can be used to top kill it, and then as it re-sprouts, then it can be hit with herbicide. But you're not going to get rid of these without herbicide. One thing we have found, though, is you know they've got those big thorns on them, and those are very notorious for popping tires of um, pickups, trailers, that type of thing. One of the things, uh, one of our undergrads did a little study this spring, and he looked at if you could run a fire over the thorns if that would make it less likely to pop and he found that it would so you know it's not going to make it so it will never pop a tire but it greatly reduces the chances um, so we you know I think eventually we'll recommend burning because it can help you get back into that area but it will never just kill the tree itself. We've got two more calorie pair questions um, the first one is where is the calorie pair on the invasive curve and then is it used as rootstock for fruit trees? It is beyond everything on the invasive curve. So that's one of those managed at the local level only, right? You can clear your 
pasture your field your yard of it and that's it it's just it's everywhere in the southeast uh, most of the eastern u.s to be honest uh, and it is unfortunately pyrus calendriana is a rootstock that's still used in the fruit tree industry um, it was brought here be you know so that tree was actually brought here because of the fruit tree industry um, back in the early 1900s there was a bacterial disease fire blight that was infecting um, European pears, which is the ones we get our food from. So the, the industry was sort of really struggling. They brought Pyrus calorian over here and grafted it to those because it conferred some resistance. Calorian is mostly resistant to fire blight. So that worked in that respect, okay? So it, it conferred that fire blight, the pear industry was good, everything's cool. But it's just such a hardy rootstock. It, it survives droughts, it survives floods, it can handle poor soil, rocky soil it's just a really strong rootstock and for that reason uh it's it's used a lot for fruit tree grafting unfortunately so here's a question if i have a bradford pear tree on private property should i cut it down yes you should i i would i would advocate cutting down you know every bradford pear and and there's a lot of reasons for it, it a, they contribute to the calorie pair. Right? It's a direct contributor to calorie pair getting out everywhere. Uh, B, it's, you know, as it gets 15, 20 years old, it's, if you look at it wrong, it's going to start dropping branches and big limbs, right? They, they break. They're notorious for breaking. Um, and C, there's just so many great things you can put in their place, okay? Um, if you want beautiful fall red color, you can do American beech, bright yellow, black gum, bright red, viburnum, bright red. If you want those spring flowers, there's, there's the magnolias. There's, there's, you know, all sorts of stuff you can put in there in this place. So I personally have very little, um, I, I see very little positives with Bradford Pear. It was one of those things that before we knew what we know now, it looked great. It won awards from the horticultural industry, but I think we know enough now to know that it's just not a good thing to, to plant or have. Any concern about Chinese elm? Are they still using them for landscaping around Clemson? I mean, yeah, I have concern. I, I don't know if they're using them around landscaping. I know at Clemson, uh, the city horticulturalist, Tony Tidwell, is really good about putting native stuff in. So I, I do know that Chinese elm, you know, anywhere there's a Chinese elm, you just need to find a clump of debris somewhere. And there's probably a Chinese elm seedling growing in it. They're very prolific. They make a lot of seed. Um, that's kind of one of those on the watch list that that I we may have trouble with it coming up. We just haven't seen it yet. Trish and Mark want to know how effective are programs to remove invasives from natural areas, uh, in banks, parks, etc. Is it hopeless, or should we still be trying to get some out of there? No, they're very effective, you know. And I think the key with invasives, especially invasive plants that have taken over large areas is consider what's realistically feasible, right? If you've got 100 acres, you're probably not going to get that totally clear, especially if you're doing it by hand, you know, in one shot. Um, there's, there's always a way to, to take that out. And there's been some very successful programs. The Weed Wrangle program is a really good one that happens, uh, started in Nashville and kind of branched out. You can clear a lot of area with some volunteers or with the right uh, treatment techniques. So, it's, it's hopeless in that a lot of these invasive plants are never going to be gone, period, from, from everywhere, but they're definitely manageable um, on a local level, and I would argue they're easier to manage than insects because, again, they're not moving, right? You can remove that stuff. You'll have to go back, you know, two, maybe three years after that to make sure the seed bank hasn't germinated and it's sort of retreat, but you can completely reclaim a site. If you get native plants, sometimes native plants will just grow after the invasives are removed and then they will sort of take over themselves. Uh, and other times you can do some restoration plantings, put native stuff in there and then it will take hold. And then the ecosystem sort of resets back to what it was and, and sort of gets healthy again. And Trisha Mark, I will let you know, if you, wanna, if you want help with planning an invasive species removal, please send me an email. Um, you've got my email from the registration. We often do litter sweeps and have done some invasive plant removals, especially as we're working to help get different communities certified as well. So um, we'd love to help you out with that. Let's see, we've got a few more questions. Someone said, I never thought about gallery as a rootstock. Should we not buy fruit trees grafted on it? You know, I 
calorie. I would advocate for not. Um, all it takes for that, and so the way that calorie pair works, you know, if, if a, well, if you buy a fruit tree grafted on it, you're still supporting the production of calorie pair, right? So somewhere they're growing those Pyrus caloriana to use as rootstock. Um, and all it takes, if you've got a fruit tree, it takes one shoot to grow up off that root uh, or off a, a, you know, a root that's maybe close to the ground. If that thing grows into a tree and has flowers, then that can pollinate Bradford's and you get the whole calorie pair cycle started. Um, you know, that said, you're sort of splitting hairs. I, I think if you have a fruit tree on a pyrus calorie on a root stock and you just make sure that that root stock never sends up a shoot, you know, it, it is what it is. Gary wants to know if herbicides are effective. Yes, very effective for, for, for any of these invasive plants. Um, that is probably our number one way we control them is different herbicides, either different formulations, uh, application techniques, or timing of, uh, of application. That varies based on what you've got. I'm giving you an example, privet, for example, which is one of those, you know, those are super common invasive shrub. You can hit that in late January, early February with glyphosate. You know, it was Roundup, now it's just glyphosate. You can buy it off the shelf practically anywhere. Um, and you can just do a broadcast foliar spray. And in, in that time of year, there's really nothing else growing. Privet is going to be evergreen, so it's still got its leaves on. And in a couple of weeks, it's just all the leaves drop and it's dead. And it's a really great, easy way to do it. You don't need, you know, you don't have to be selective. You just spray it and it's gone. Um, so yes, herbicides are extremely effective. And um, I want to remind everyone, if you are using herbicides, the labels of law, follow that thing to the T. Wear your personal protective equipment for herbicides. You need your closed toed shoes, boots, pants, long sleeve shirt, chemical resistant gloves, eye protection, hat is preferable. So make sure you're being safe out there if you're doing that. But yes, herbicides are really effective. The next question was how to get rid of privet. So you answered that one. There you go. That, honestly, that's the easiest thing to do is just spray that uh, foliar spray in late January, early February, maybe earlier if you're down um, in the low country when it gets, you know, as long as it's just the very, very, very beginning of spring before any of the spring ephemerals come up, hit that stuff with herbicide. And then that glyphosate's not going to have any residual effects. So if it gets on the ground, something can grow up through it, it's going to be fine. It's going to kill that privet real nice. Other than Asian giant hornets, what species should we report to government officials if we see them and which agency is best? Uh, agent, so the agency to report suspected um, invasives is for South Carolina, the Department of Plant Industries, DPI. Um, I'm, I don't, for North Carolina, it's probably the Department of Ag, although um, you could also go to the University Extension Service, right, because they will be able to funnel it up. For North Carolina, I know who I ever always go to is Dr. Matt Bertone. He runs the plant uh, insect diagnostic lab. Uh, here at Clemson, uh, go through DPI or your local county extension agent. Um, you know, we keep a, a watch list of stuff out there. If you see them on the dashboard, report that because we're always trying to see if it's in new places. Um, and then every state has a list of what, you know, what to keep your eye out for. So it varies based on what state you're in. But if you Google state and then invasive species, you'll get a good list of what we're after. Greg says, since exotic plants are part of the existing landscape, despite the preference for natives, he wants to know if there's any symbiotic relationships that are evolving between native poll pollinators and such things as azaleas and camellias. You know, I don't know about symbiotic, but I know native pollinators will use uh, exotic plants. I mean, native pollinators, I think by and large, don't discriminate too much on what they use. Um, so, so I know their use is there. The question we have is, for these non-native plants, are the native pollinators getting the nutrition they normally would from a native plant, right? Is, the, is that food as good for them as it would be from a native? And I don't, I, don't, I don't personally know. I don't know that we know that yet because they're sort of just getting into testing how, how nutritious pollen can be. Let's see. Um, can we use climate change data or vegetation maps to predict potential invasive species so that we can get ahead of the curve? Yeah, they're trying to do that. They're trying to um, 
use those data in a manner that, that helps us figure out what's coming next. Um, with plants, it's um, most of our invasive plants come from horticulture and egg, you know, stuff that gets brought in. And not so much egg anymore. Back in the early uh, 1900s, there was actually a department of the USDA whose job was to bring in stuff that was not from here and see if we could use it. Now, most of our escapes come from just horticulture, but uh, more so on the insect and fungal side, we're using that climate change data to figure out, you know, what might happen if it, as it warms, right? And you're seeing this stuff from Central America, South America, Cuba, Mexico, can that get into some different types of forests and move, move north? And a really good example is um, the mountain pine beetle. So this is actually a native insect. It's the one that's out west, Colorado, um, killing all the, the ponderosa pine out there. But as it has gotten warmer, that beetle has moved farther north in Canada. And it's not far enough north where it's, it's moved sort of above, above the Rocky Mountains, and now it's heading east across and so you know now we wonder well is that going to eventually make it here i don't know it, it it may it may not but we're definitely seeing shifts in where insects are because of the clean the changing climate um southern pine beetle is another one you know in the last few years there's been some really big outbreaks up in the northeastern u.s new york new jersey especially right and, and traditionally southern pine beetle was a very southern pest right because of what it's named and where it lives but as the, the weather warms, as the climate warms, it's starting to move northward. So we are trying to use those data to figure out, to get ahead of the curve. That's actually it for the questions. If anybody's got anything else to add, go ahead and pop that in. Um, Susan, I know you asked about native species. I'll include our list of native plants from our website and our follow-up email with the recorded link from this presentation. Dave, you've got a lot of compliments on the great program. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Give one more minute for any last minute questions and then we will call it. And I want to just remind everyone for any, any type of questions about the insects and the fungi and the plants, go to your, your local extension office, right? We're there to help you. There's an agent assigned to every county. So um, very easy to find just whatever state you're in, Google extension, your land grant university, and that will get you hooked up. All right, we just got a couple more wonderful, great program. So we call it. Thank you, Dave. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks for having me on.